Hereby call this meeting to order and ask for a recording of the members present and absent. Would you call a roll, please? Commissioner Kevin Potter. Here. Second Congressional District Commissioner David Conway. Third Congressional District Commissioner Charles Ortega. I see him online. Can you hear us, Charles? Go ahead and move on for now. Fourth Congressional District Commissioner Lindy Ritz. Here. Fifth Congressional District Commissioner Blake Rainey. Here. At large Commissioner Chairman Jim Putnam. Here. At large Commissioner Jerry Hunter. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Good, and uh, we'll proceed. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the Aeronautics Commission meeting on March 10th. Are there any connect, uh, corrections or additions to those minutes at this time? Okay, hearing none, I vote for approval of those minutes. I'll entertain a motion for the same. I'll second. Okay, would you call the vote, please? Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Conway. Commissioner Ortega. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Motion carried. All right. The next item is director's report. Director Artis, you looks like you have a number of items to cover today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been a busy couple of months uh, at the Aeronautics Commission uh, as Things started opening back up and we're getting back into the spring season. We have uh, been doing some traveling and getting out and seeing the sites and doing some uh, some meetings. So it's been a busy couple months. Combine that with the legislative session that's ongoing. Um, started off uh, shortly after our March meeting. Uh, we had the uh, Bristow CTS groundbreaking. Uh, we've joked, I think we need to take up residency at Bristow, uh, given how many times we've been there in the last four or five years. We uh, Obviously, we've had a, a lot of good success stories out there, as uh, some of you all saw last summer when we opened up that brand new runway. Uh, CTS has had several groundbreakings. I think this was the uh, the third. That was the joke of the day. I was trying to figure out what number of groundbreaking this was. They've expanded several times. Um, CTS, Consolidated Turbine Specialist, is a company owned by uh, Kratos Defense, um, and CTS is in the business of making engines and repairing engines. Uh, mostly in the, in the PT-6 world or, or the government world, uh, government engines, whether it's fixed wing or helicopter. And they have a long-term vision of, of actually bringing aircraft into the field uh, to be able to take the engines off the airplane there, repair them, put them back on and, and, and send them on their way. Uh, this expansion is going to bring in an additional 19,000 square feet to their already, uh, I believe it's 30 or 40,000 square foot facility. Uh, with the expansion, they're going to expect over the next five years to employ approximately 100 total employees. I think they're right at about 40 or 50 right now. Um, great thing for a small community in Bristol, Oklahoma, a company like that uh, in their back door. And it's those stories are repeating themselves across the state. Uh, as, as we've seen a lot of the economic development releases, um, companies like CTS are, are growing, they're sustaining, and, and they're doing pretty well. And, and we're proud to help however we can. Uh, obviously that runway expansion extension was a, a pretty big deal for Bristow, uh, going to allow some of that King Air, that turbine traffic to fly in uh, and be able to take the engines off right there at the facility and then uh, send them on their way. So great thing at Bristow CTS. I think uh, Commissioner Rainey, you were there with me on that one. We didn't get to fly in, a little, uh, little, little stormy that day, but uh, it was a pretty good event, I think. So. Uh, and then uh, following that, uh, Commissioner Rainey and I uh, visited the Shawnee Regional Airport. That time we did get to fly. Um, that was a beautiful flying day. Uh, March, uh, March 19th, I uh, went over there to visit the airport manager as well as the airport chairman. Uh, just kind of discuss all things about the airport, do a little introduction between ourselves, uh, Commissioner Rainey and, and the airport manager and airport chairman. Uh, in, in our terminal building, one of our first terminal buildings we ever did uh, there at Shawnee as part of our terminal building program. Uh, beautiful facility, the, their next big project that they have going on is we're trying to figure out how to reconfigure their apron. Uh, we're gonna reconstruct that apron sometime in the next four to five year window. Uh, and so they just finished up a supplemental discretionary project to seal coat and crack seal both the runway and the taxiway. It was in pretty good shape and so uh, they've got some good things. Also, a couple of good businesses that are going on out there at uh, 
Shawnee Regional, um, taking advantage of some of the expansion of the Oklahoma City metro area and some of the growing uh, growing east the Oklahoma City area and Midwest City, uh, Dell City, Choctaw is doing uh, for the metro. So great, great thing there. Um, follow that up with a uh, virtual speaking engagement at the Oklahoma City's Innovation District Annual Symposium. Uh, this year they had a real tie to unmanned autonomous vehicles, uh, so on and so forth. I spoke on the regulatory and policy issues panel, uh, along with James Grimsley and uh, Leslie Gamble from AAA. Uh, we all know James Grimsley with the Choctaw Nation. Uh, Dean Jim Roth, Dean of the OCU Law School was our moderator. And we just kind of talked about the regulatory and the policy issues that are gonna be impacting uh, UAS and, and urban air mobility type aircraft uh, into the next five, 10 and, and 20 years. Obviously one of the, the biggest limitations on UAS being able to jump forward and really propel itself into that next great technology for aviation aerospace is the, the regulatory and the policy environment. Um, and so I think there is a lot of good discussion uh, along the lines of how are we going to accept, uh, how the, how's the public going to accept this new technology? Uh, what's the regulatory environment gonna look like both at the federal, the state and the local level because all those different areas are gonna be impacted as we all go through this process of introducing and integrating UAS uh, into our daily lives. And I think it's gonna be a good thing Going to be it's going to be a long journey uh, it's not going to be an overnight journey by any stretch of the imagination so uh we're but we're excited about that and i was glad to be able to participate on that particular panel on march 30th uh, we did a legislative visit with our oklahoma airport operators association uh instead of we didn't have uh, aero day at the capitol this year uh, capitol's been pretty much closed down uh both from the repair standpoint as well as as covid uh, early on in the session and so we didn't get to have aero day at the capitol this year so Several of our airport members, uh, as part of the Airport Operators Association, wanted to go stand up in front of the legislature, advocate for airport issues and aviation aerospace issues in general. Uh, that was a really good showing. Uh, Sandra about killed us that day, I think. Uh, if yeah, if you advance the slides, there's some photos. Um, oh, sorry, that's that. That's Bristow CTS. Keep there. We go. Um, so we uh, visited with Lieutenant Governor, uh, several senators and representatives. We saw the speaker that day uh, and kind of just talked about the gamut of aviation aerospace legislative items um, and had a team A in the morning, team B in the afternoon. Uh, I think we hit almost 30 legislators, Sandra. Does that sound about right? Yeah, so uh, it, was, it was quite the whirlwind day. And, and yes, uh, if Sandra ever takes you to the Capitol, bring your walking shoes. She will, uh, she will make you walk around that place left and right for the entirety of the day. So, but it was a good thing. It was a great thing to get the airport officials. And I think we're gonna try and repeat that process for legislative uh, sessions uh, in the future. On uh, April 1st, went and visited with uh, some officials from the Oklahoma History Center, uh, saw their new space exhibit, uh, which was uh, pretty neat. Uh, they've got a great space exhibit. One of the things they're wanting to do and, and build upon that is taking us back in history along the timeline of aviation and how did Oklahoma get its name in the aviation uh, realm. There, there's a lot of great aviation history, as you've heard from my predecessor, uh, from the books that, that have been created, and just from your all's general knowledge of aviation history here in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, Wiley Post is a, is a big one. Uh, and some of the things that he was able to do for the oilies, the early oilies, uh, and taking them out to their oil fields uh, there, there's a long line of great history moments. And so they're wanting to maybe create an aviation history exhibit uh, out there at the Oklahoma History Center. And so I think that would be a, a great thing. And as we get that going, uh, we may be reaching out to you all for suggestions and maybe donations as well. So um, follow that on uh, Tulsa tour and a Will Rogers tour with uh, Senator Inhofe's staff. I think most of you all know uh, Dan Hillenbrand, uh, who was the longtime aviation staffer for Senator Inhofe uh, moved on and got kicked up the uh, line a little bit, has become legislative director. We're extremely glad to have him in that role, but we're also sad to see him go as the uh, aviation point person. Uh, he was introducing us to a, a couple of new uh, gentlemen who are running aviation uh, for them. Uh, and so we uh, met with uh, Victor Sarmiento and Dixon Yonan, uh, and they're the uh, LA and LC uh, respectively for uh, Senator Inhofe and, and the aviation staff. And so we took them on a little tour of a couple of airports, a couple of the big airports, got to see up in the Tulsa International Airport control tower uh, and, and how bad that is and how badly that needs to be replaced. Uh, 
Um, so that was, that was a good, good couple of days there um, in April. Uh, Commissioner Randy and I went and spoke to the Engineers Flying Club on April the 6th. Uh, I believe there was probably 35, 40 people at that Engineers Flying Club meeting. Um, Engineers Flying Club's out at Wiley Post. I believe they have four, four airplanes. Um, and uh, just kind of talked about the general aviation aerospace industry, what we do as a commission, uh, ways they can get more involved. Uh, obviously, we're always excited about aviators that are passionate about teaching the next generation of pilots. And that was one of the things that we hit on is how can they better position themselves to teach young people and get more young people excited about becoming a pilot and just about aviation aerospace careers in general. So um, that, was a, that was a pretty good, pretty good visit. On uh, April 19th, I don't know when I recorded it, but on April 19th, they played a pre-recorded session um, for the South Central chapter of the American Association of Airport Executives. Uh, we talked about the state of state aviation, had several of my colleagues from Texas and New Mexico uh, and Arkansas on that panel as well. And we just kind of talked about the general state of aviation, uh, how we're coming back from the pandemic uh, and the various things that are taking place uh, in our aviation offices. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a really good panel, really good discussion uh, led by a former state aviation official who's now the, I believe the number two person there at the Sunport, Sunport in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Jane Lucera was our moderator for that panel and it was a, a good discussion and a, and a good visit there. Uh, follow that on uh, with a virtual presentation to the Missouri State Chamber uh, Conference. Uh, we have obviously been very proud of our engineer tax credits for aerospace here in this state. Uh, and, and other states have wanted to replicate that uh, many times. They've been unsuccessful. I believe we're still the only state that can say that we have the engineer tax credits for aerospace. It's a, it's a good thing, good feather in our cap. Uh, but the folks there in Missouri were interested in hearing about it. Uh, they wanted to know how it got passed, the background, the story behind it, uh, and what they could do to uh, kind of mirror and, and bring forth a similar proposition for Missouri. Uh, we we're obviously excited about that. Any, anytime someone's trying to emulate what you're doing, you know you're doing something right and doing something well. So uh, had, a, had a good conversation with those Missouri state officials uh, and some of the chamber officials from across the, the state of Missouri. Uh, April 27th through the 29th, that was our first in-person conference with MRO Americas in Orlando. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, about 60% probably of what a normal conference would be, but everybody that was there was extremely excited uh, to be there in person. Uh, this is the first conference we have been to uh, as a state since probably early 2020, if not late 2019. As you can see there in that picture, that's the Oklahoma booth. Uh, it's Jeff Camp and I with uh, Jeff Camp from the Department of Commerce. Uh, we are known as the MRO Capital of the World, and that's a, it's a big conference, good opportunity for Oklahoma companies. I believe we had seven with us on that trip uh, in our booth to make connections, uh, build business, bring business back to Oklahoma. And we also were all obviously on the... Uh, hot recruiting trail of trying to bring companies to Oklahoma. Um, I think as we've seen as part of this pandemic and, and how Oklahoma has handled it, how we've opened up and how we've been friendly to our businesses and very supportive of our businesses, there's a lot of folks from both coasts and from other states that may not uh, have been as friendly as we are that are excited to try and relocate to Oklahoma. So it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that commerce is doing and trying to recruit all those different companies and we're there to help however we can uh, on that recruiting trail. And this was a, it's a great event. Uh, looking forward to many more into the future. Followed that on with uh, the OU Aviation Advisory Board meeting. Commissioner Ritz uh, was there uh, in attendance and participated. Uh, that was our first uh, board meeting, hopefully our last virtual board meeting. We have one of those uh, in the spring and one of those in the fall um, and kind of discussed the state of the OU Aviation Program, introduced the new OU Aviation Director, Eric Widra, um, and he was a, a, a good thing, good thing for the program, good hire for the program moving forward, and I'm um, looking, looking to uh, see how we can help the, the OU Aviation Program uh, move forward. Uh, followed that on with the AUVSI Exponential uh, Virtual Event, May 4th through the 6th. This was just simply a, an additive. The actual AUVSI in-person show is going to happen in August. Uh, this was just simply an additional virtual event that they held to uh, support uh, what they're trying to do uh, and make sure, because typically the AU, AUVSI conference is about this time of year. And so they wanted to have a, a virtual event now and they're gonna hold their in-person event. 
Yes, sir. Chris, would you explain that, that acronym? Oh, uh, the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. So they are the commonly referred to the UAS organization. Okay. Uh, they obviously involve themselves in a lot of autonomous vehicles, ground vehicles, sea vehicles, but uh, their big thing is, is UAS. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's another another recruiting trip, another great recruiting trip that Commerce does uh, and that the state of Oklahoma is able to do um, for, for us. Um, we had a couple of really good deals ongoing yesterday. Uh, yesterday was a great day for OAC at the Capitol. Uh, we had a Aero Caucus event, the first Aero Caucus of this year, probably the only Aero Caucus meeting of this year. Uh, we had about 40, 40 legislators, Sandra, roughly, wow. uh, in attendance at our Aero Caucus meeting up on the uh, fifth floor in the appropriations room. Um, it was it was amazing. Uh, obviously. People are excited about aviation aerospace. I think the, the biggest caucus meeting we'd had before that was maybe 20 or 25 legislators. Typically we have breakfasts in, in the morning at maybe is 15 or 20. So to have 40 plus there was a was a really big thing. And they heard a lot of great things. Paula Keaty told them about aviation aerospace education and, and how they can uh, get more involved in their local districts and help us with school administration and school administrators to implement some of the curriculum ideas that we have in the AOPA curriculum uh, for their classrooms. And so it was a, it was a good day. Uh, OAOA was the uh, partner and, and purchased the lunch and was a sponsor for the lunch. And so we we're greatly appreciative of that. And we heard some great stories from Paul Priegel at Stillwater and Alexis Higgins at Tulsa International. Uh, it was just overall uh, a really great day, something to be very proud of uh, seeing that Aero Caucus event uh, and hearing some of the great things that are going to be happening uh, in the aviation aerospace industry. And last but not least, we uh, closed it out with the, the state chamber's uh, celebratory uh, event last night, made a, a lot of good connections, saw a lot of the same legislators that we had at the Aero Caucus meeting uh, there that yesterday evening, continued that conversation uh, and, and really had a, a, a good couple of visits with both current, former uh, officials, legislative officials, as well as a lot of higher ups uh, in various uh, chamber and economic development uh, regions as well. So that uh, is my report. Commissioners, I tried to make that as brief as possible, but I will uh, stand for any questions or comments. Sounds like a busy couple months. It has been, yes. Thank you, Andrea, for managing my calendar during that time frame. I'm sure she uh, she's, she keeps me straight and keeps me on the right path and tells me where I need to be and when I need to be there. Okay. Any questions? We'll move on to the next item, please. Grayson, item uh, five. This is going to be a, a tag tag team event here uh, with uh, Mr. Nick Young. Uh, we had our first and hopefully last uh, virtual uh, conference with the Oklahoma Airport Operators Association. Uh, it was a good conference. I was involved in three different panels. Uh, did our first opening panel with uh, Glenn Bowles, the, the manager of our FAA Airports District Office, uh, on kind of just a brief overview of, of what's going on in Oklahoma in terms of the, the funding streams and the various things that uh, we are involved in, in terms of programming and planning various projects. Uh, then I moderated a panel, a couple of panels, uh, navigating the state capitol. Uh, I moderated Sandra and uh, Monty Smith, who is with uh, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. She's their legislative liaison. And we're trying to impart upon our fellow airports how important it is to get involved in the capitol, in the legislative game to at least know your legislator, invite them out to the airport. And so I think we uh, hopefully made some progress on that. Uh, and then lastly, but not least, a uh, very important session that I moderated was on economic development and how airports can better take advantage of economic development opportunities in their local community. Uh, we had me debates from the Ardmore Development Authority, who we all know is a very uh, important person for economic development in South Central Oklahoma. They've done a lot of great things there at the Ardmore uh, Municipal Airport. We had uh, Jeff Camp at the Department of Commerce who obviously is our state's key uh, economic development person for aviation aerospace uh, and runs the ACES program. And then we have Jeff Seymour with the Oklahoma City Chamber, who uh, is their economic development strategist for the chamber, but also has some past experience in smaller, more rural communities and doing economic development there. So he's able to give kind of that uh, two-fangled approach and, and perspective on economic development for airports, both big and small. So. Uh, that was pretty good. Those are the three sessions I moderated, but I think there was some other good stuff out there, Nick, as well. Absolutely, Director. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. Uh, some of the other 
sessions that were brought forth with the OA, OA virtual conference was a back to basics airport 101 session. Uh, thank you to Peter Van Felt of KSA Engineering. He has a lot of background in airport management and really went through many different subjects such as leases, rates and charges, um, different, different types of things you'd see at any size of airport. So both airports large and small could really learn from that session to how to best manage their airport, whether they're new to the game or if they've been around for a while and just haven't hit on some of those topic, topics in a while. Loomakers Wildlife Service, uh, Darby Albrecht with Loomakers went over a great managing wildlife on airport session. This uh, touched on very low cost solutions for airports across the state. Maybe they don't have a depredation permit, those types of things. Uh, they just offered some low cost insights on how to mitigate some of the wildlife concerns that everybody across the state deals with on airport uh, properties. So great sessions from Loomakers. Also talked about the importance of internships at your airport, thanks to the fine folks at Tulsa, uh, Norman and Stillwater Airport. So Paul, Foster, uh, Lance, Alexis, uh, all those folks at those three airports did a great job providing insight on how to provide a path forward for the next generation to get hands-on experience. Because really we wanna make sure that those that are coming into the work, you know, the workforce for airports in aviation have an opportunity to get that hands-on learning experience rather than simply just learning from the book. So great, uh, great session by them. And a lot of folks just don't know where to start. And so that's what OAOA is really trying to do is put that uh, kind of a baseline out there so folks can build off of that at their airports. There was also a great motivational speaker of Hetty Coleman out of Stillwater. So thanks to Paul Priegel of Stillwater for putting that. This was a session on leading through adversity. So Hetty Coleman put on a great presentation that's really lifted the attendee spirits while also giving them the tools that they need to, to press on and lead through tough, tough seasons as we've all recently experienced. So other sessions included UAS operations and requirements around airports thanks to the FAA. So they did a great presentation there. Also GA airports and their importance to military operations. It was led by the discussion led by Adam Fox uh, with the Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Heal and Captain Matt Simpson with that conversation. And then marketing and public relations at your airport thanks to Lance Lampkin, Sandra Shelton and Austin Wheeler of Riverside and Tulsa. So this event was a pretty interesting layout. What they did is instead of doing full day sessions they just did them in the afternoon. So really it was a pretty refreshing to be able to do some of our work there in the office in the morning hours and then be able to transition that um, into the conference sessions in the afternoon. So really help break up the day while we could still keep up with our day-to-day -day operations at the office. It also led to some great retention rates for OAOA as they kept, uh, they only had a couple people drop off throughout the course of each day. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, a lot of these virtual conferences, you'd have folks that would drop off toward the end of the day or the end of the week. And really they only had one or two, maybe a handful that would drop off throughout the end of the day. And that actually carried through um, throughout the entirety of the conference there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, aside from that, uh, previous, um, the outgoing president of OAOA was also selected uh, by OAOA, the Oklahoma Airport Operators Association, as the airport manager of the year. So if we uh, go forward one slide, we have Lance Lampkin, who recently also earned his AAE accreditation over the past year, um, also getting his recognized as airport of the year for, here for the state of Oklahoma. So congratulations to him. And then one more slide on this, uh, actually congratulations continue as OU Max Westheimer Airport was selected as the 2021 airport of the year. So congratulations to Lance and the other fine folks there at uh, OU Max Westheimer. As many of you know, that's where I got my start. So they do have a special place in my heart. So congratulations to them. And we also look forward to the new leadership at OAOA. So Lance has passed the gavel on to Paul Priegel of Stillwater and uh, also Alexis Higgins of Tulsa International will be the vice president for the next year. And so that is all of my update. Sorry for the prolonged update, but it was a great session. Uh, great sessions at a great conference, but we stand for any questions. Thank you, Nick, appreciate it very much. Thank you. Six Grace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, South Grand Lake Regional Airport. We can go to the some of the pictures. So uh, South Grand Lake Regional um, is a wonderful story. Uh, for those that were in attendance, I think Commissioner Rainey was there. I'm not sure if any of the other commissioners were able to make it, but it's a great story of grassroots aviation growing up into a really, really fine airport. Um, in 2006, 2007, they were just simply a grass strip in the middle of a field. Uh, and 
thanks to a lot of the leadership and a lot of the local officials that had the desire and the drive to make it a big airport and an important airport, uh, they were able to get it paved, uh, get a paved 5,000 foot runway. We were able to provide them some grants based on some of the uh, things that happened at uh, another airport in that area that had to close or not, excuse me, close, but be removed from the system and, and become private, uh, so on and so forth. And really this was the day to celebrate their new runway. We were basically doing a complete reconstruct. It was a mill and overlay on the existing runway. We widened it out to 75 feet to meet standards. We put new runway lights in. Uh, it's been a long time coming uh, for South Grand Lake Regional Airport. Uh, when we did the Bristow celebration last year, uh, both Director Bird at the time and I said, we need to do more of these kinds of celebrations. We need to involve ourselves and, and really pat ourselves, pat the airports on the back for these monumentous occasions. Um, obviously with COVID and, and being winter time, we didn't get to necessarily have a lot of those celebrations over the fall and the winter, uh, but we came back knowing that we wanted to do something here at South Grand Lake for their runway grand opening. Uh, we had it in a, one of the tenants, large hangars, 150 by 100 hangar, uh, about 150, maybe close to 200 people showed up both uh, from the local entity as well as uh, from just the surrounding area. Uh, we had Senator Inhofe who was there, who was our keynote. Um, obviously, for those of you that don't know it, his second home airport behind, behind RL Jones. Uh, he's got keeps his airplanes up there. He's got a house on the lake. Um, so he's very excited to celebrate this for one of his, his home facilities uh, there in Northeast Oklahoma. Um, there's, there's a program that we've created and Sandra, I don't know if we've sent that program around to the commissioners, but if not, we might want to uh, do that after the meeting. It, it talks about the story of South Grand and, and how that airport came about. Something that probably won't ever be repeated again because most of our airports have been in session for the last you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, old World War II facilities. Uh, Speaker McCall was able to fly in. Uh, we had our local state senator and state reps uh, from that area that were also in attendance. Uh, Secretary Gatz was our MC for the uh, the event, uh, and it was just a really really good event. Um, and this is going to kind of springboard us into the future for these kinds of airports event, uh, airport events. We're actually hosting another one this Friday in Skyatook uh, to celebrate their new runway reconstruction. And so as we get involved in more of these celebrations of airport projects, this is going to be something that's very important to shine the light on the betterment of the airport system for Oklahoma. And we'll probably be doing some of these, maybe six, seven, eight a year as construction projects finish, monumental construction projects finish at these various airports, trying to get our state officials, our local officials, and just the local community to understand the importance of these airports. And it's really been a good thing, uh, been a good team effort amongst the transportation cabinet. Can't say thank you enough to Secretary Gatz and some of the staff that he has that have helped us with these events. Uh, we could not put these on uh, without their assistance. This is a, this is a big heavy lift. A lot, of the, a lot of planning, a lot of effort went into these. Uh, and as you can see right there, there's a video. Uh, is that on our YouTube channel, Sandra? It's on our YouTube channel, you can see uh, the cutting of the ribbon. Uh, we also had a little flyover from a couple of uh, w, WW2 era warbirds. Uh, I think we had a Yak, and then I believe it may have been a T-28. I can't remember, Mr. Rainey, if you remember what the other airplane was. Was it T6? Okay, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're right, T6. T6 and a yak. Um, so it was a good event and, and it's something that the commission can be really proud of, uh, something we're gonna continue to do into the future. Um, Sky took is on Friday, and then we're looking probably at Ponca City sometime in the month of June. So uh, more of these events to come, would encourage you all to attend if you would like to, uh, and certainly can, can coordinate trips and assistance with uh, however you want us to help, so. Uh, any questions on that uh, particular item, Commissioner? You say Sky took Friday? Sky took us Friday, 11 o'clock. Um, if you're flying in, I would encourage you to get there a little early. We're going to have some skydivers. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to be uh, having any conflictions between airplanes and skydivers, preferably. Okay. And if you're wanting to come, Mr. Chairman, we can get you the action, that we can get you the legit details of. All right. I'd like to learn more so about forth. it. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Item seven. Along. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 2021 legislative session has, uh, it's been a good one. Uh, my first legislative session in this role, um, met, met a lot of good legislators, uh, had a lot of good conversations about furthering the aviation aerospace industry, 
uh, trying to get some more additional funding into airport investment, so on and so forth. Um, and so I want to, to bring Sandra up and she can talk about some of the, the state efforts that we have going on. And then I would like to follow on with that, maybe talk a little bit about the congressional uh, at the federal level as well. Sandra. Morning, commissioners. This is an exciting time at the state capitol. At the state capitol, I just want to tell you about the environment there. Pretty much everyone is vaccinated, and so people are doing and conducting their business pretty much as normal. Um, Senate Bill 893 is the engineer tax credit bill, and this bill is the only bill still pending um, regarding any aviation and aerospace bills, and uh, it has been referred to something called a conference committee. They have rejected the House amendments, and so Senator Pugh is working with Senator Rader, Rosino, Simpson, Kurt, and Hicks to sign this bill out of conference, and then it will be have to be passed on both in both chambers again. So what's happening right now in the chamber um, is they're working on the budget, and there's a lot of bills in conference, and so they're trying to uh, navigate those. Some of the conference committees actually meet in person. If you go on the House website, you'll see uh, little conferences and things like that, public safety, health, all of these things. And so you're welcome to go and, and view those things. I do want to tell you that Senate Bill 659, the UAS Clearinghouse Bill for the Aeronautics Commission, a request bill by Director Artes, passed and was signed by the governor on May 5th. It becomes effective November 1st. We are very proud of this accomplishment. Senator Rosino did a great job. And so we will be looking forward to establishing um, what the bill outlines. And I know Director Artes will speak more about that. Um, and then House Bill 1376 allows the Aeronautics Commission to use the ODOT bidding system. And I'll uh, allow Director Artes to expand on that and maybe uh, Chief Wadsworth. But the bill passed and was signed on April 21st and goes into effect November 1st. And uh, you can see on your um, summary sheet that I provided, there are some bills dormant and those are listed at the bottom. And I'd be happy to yield to any questions that you might have, any concerns that you have regarding the capital, I'm always available to you. Removing the cap, obviously, is of great interest to us. Yes, you'll see there it's in the dormant bill, sir. Uh, it's Senate Bill 258 and House Bill 2257. We can, um, those bills will be alive next year and we can take them up where we left off and we can try again. Okay. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Andrew. Is there, is there any more traction? I know we've been trying to do the tax, um, I mean, the, the cap for a long time. Any, any movement in, in our favor, do you think? I'll let Director Artie speak to that. I do think Director Artie's had a, a meeting with um, the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and I'll let him speak about that. But Senator Thompson is warming to the agency, and we look forward to working with him on that next year. Good. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, just to, to follow on with that, we did have a good conversation with uh, Chairman Thompson and, and he's been a friend of aviation aerospace for some time. And, and we kind of explained to him what the cap uh, meant to us and what it means to the aviation aerospace industry, what it means to airports. Uh, and they, they understand it and get it. Uh, and so hopefully next session we'll be able to uh, either lift or remove that cap entirely. Um, it, it was kind of just caught up in the, the general idea of how do we get more airport investment into the system. And so I'm hopeful uh, for next session, I'm hopeful maybe for this session uh, that we're able to shake loose uh, something uh, out of that. And so that at the end of the day, it will be a, a bill we're going to try next session. I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, at the beginning of this session, when that bill was first moving through the process, the budget was not necessarily looked at as being very, very bright. Now, as we've moved on into towards the latter part of session, the budget has started looking a little brighter and brighter. I think uh, Chris Wadsworth will talk to you a little bit about some of the gross receipts that have been coming in to the, uh, the state coffers and, and how that picture is being looked at a little differently than it was at the beginning of session. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, as always to try and get that lifted. Um, I don't think we're, of any, we're in any kind of uh, cautionary stance of exceeding that cap this year. We have had a couple of good months of revenue, which I know Chris will talk to you about on a future agenda item, uh, but I don't know that we're in any kind of uh, spot where we're gonna exceed that. <laughs> COVID impact and the, the sales of aircraft being declined for at least eight, nine, 10 months there. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, on the, uh, the UAS and the ODOT bidding system bills, UAS bills, that's a big one. Uh, thank you to Senator Racino and Representative Hilbert for uh, leading the charge on that. 
Uh, what we're trying to do there is, is make OAC kind of that coalescing organization to get all the UAS assets of the state put together for the next big policy initiative or the next big UAS test site uh, or whatever it might be that uh, we're interested in going forth and, and really claiming as a state. Uh, that's not to prevent others from doing things individually that they want to do. We're not trying to require someone to check in with us before they do something. We just want to be that, that organizing entity. We saw in the interim study last year where other states, Virginia, North Carolina, Kansas, North Dakota, Ohio, have that single point entity in state government uh, to really be that coalescing force for UAS movement forward. So we wanted to put ourselves out there as that entity in state government here in Oklahoma, because we believe the fit makes the most sense in OAC. And uh, we really didn't have a whole lot of complaints. We didn't have anybody that really, excuse me, challenged us on that uh, and, and had a lot of good conversations about how can we better the UAS industry? How can we put our best foot forward as a state uh, to move UAS in the right direction? So uh, that was a good one. And then uh, the ODOT bidding system bill, as you know, we've had to go through the OMES process, the Office of Management Enterprise Services, but we felt because of ODOT and how they work on highways and the contractors that are doing work for ODOT are basically doing the same work for airports in terms of being the same contractor, the same skill set, same expertise. Uh, paving a roadway is just like paving a runway, minus the curbs, of course. You don't want to have a curved runway. If you have that, we have problems. Uh, but we thought it was logical to use the ODOT bidding system. We had to have a statutory change to do that. And so we were able to get uh, Speaker McCall to let us use one of his shell bills uh, in the middle of session to, to move that forward. And that's one of the, the main things that we were looking at in this grander transportation modernization initiative, which I know I've talked to you all about uh, in the past. And so very happy that those two bills uh, have made it forward and, and very hopeful that the engineer tax code for aerospace is gonna make it across the goal line this session as well. Thank you. On the, uh, the congressional update, uh, Senator Inhofe has been urging an effort to fully fund the FAA Section 625 grant program. Uh, as you all know, that's the program we applied for uh, earlier this year. Uh, that was for previous monies. It's, it's, a, it's a recurring program every year, and so they're trying to get appropriated dollars uh, in the next budgetary cycle. Uh, that's going to be very important for our workforce development, ensuring that both the pilot as well as the skilled labor, the mechanics, the sheet metal technicians, uh, so on and so forth, that that workforce pipeline is going to be there for the next 10, 20 years to support aviation aerospace at large. And so that's going to be very important that if we don't get it this go around, we're going to make another application the next go around. Even if we do get it this go around, maybe we'll still apply next go around. We can do another program uh, and apply for some of those funds. So uh, I do know Senator Inhofe's office and, and others of our congressional delegation were working hard trying to get that program going forward. Contract tower funding, very important to the state of Oklahoma, given six of our towers are in the contract tower program. They have been working forward on some of their regulatory fixes, as well as making sure that their budgetary pictures uh, in a good place. Uh, as I briefed you at the March meeting, there have been three different relief bills for airports, uh, CARES Act, uh, CRISA, which is just simply an acronym, uh, and then the American Rescue Plan. Um, and we are encouraging all of our airports to take advantage of, of that funding. Uh, CARES Act has been sitting in the airport's accounts for about six months now, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, the CRISA funding, which is the second round of funding, is just going through the application and grant offer stage right now. And then that'll be followed on with the American Rescue Plan with the grant offer and grant application stage here probably in the next couple of months. Uh, we are encouraging and sometimes cajoling, coercing, and maybe even threatening on occasion airports needing to draw down their monies uh, for uh, that CARES Act funding that they have available to them, and then also ensuring that they're going to do that same thing with the additional funding as it shows up in their account. So uh, on the congressional update, that's uh, mostly what we're looking at. I'll also tell you that we are very attuned and interested in some of the infrastructure investments that uh, are being discussed up in D.C. Um, obviously, there's a lot of discussion on both sides of the Hill and not to turn the conversation into politics, but if there is money that's coming out of DC, I'm gonna hold my hand out. And I wanna make sure airports are gonna get their fair share and their fair cut uh, for Oklahoma. Cause I think there's a lot of things that we can do with that infrastructure funding to ensure our airports are gonna be moving into the next two decades uh, with great infrastructure and therefore able to be great economic development assets for their communities and for the state as well. So uh, looking forward to that, working with several entities on language of how we can 
best allocate the different resources that may come forward, depending on what the negotiations end up looking like uh, at the federal level. So that is the end of uh, our legislative congressional and regulatory update, but I will stand for any questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to item eight, financial report. Chris Wadworth. Morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. Starting out with the financial summary document. As of April 30th, the commission had an ending cash balance of $3.3 million. Encumbrances total 3.7 million. Estimated statutory revenue for the remainder of FY21 are 273,000. And outstanding reimbursements owed to the agency total $1.5 million. The next slide, which leaves us with an estimated uh, cash balance of 1.4 million after available cash and encumbrances. Total year-to-date expenditures during FY21, as at the end of April, we were sitting at $6.4 million. Moving on to the revenue document, uh, some good news here. Total statutory revenue collected for the month of March was $937,375.73. And April was $1,477,458.28. And the bulk of those collections were from aircraft excise tax that were collected from several aircraft purchased recently. Total statutory revenues collected through April of this fiscal year, total 4.56 million compared to 4.53 million for the same time frame last year. Uh, you may recall back in March, year over year revenue, we were down about 40%. So that's quite a substantial change to now be ahead of where we were same time frame last year. You'll see there on the uh, chart there as well that they've got shown, that is our three-year average revenue that we are now up about uh, 350 or 530,000, excuse me, for the three-year average. Uh, I do wanna note, not included on those monthly revenue collection amounts, we did receive $1.5 million from the state as part of their coronavirus relief funds that they allocated to us. That's a one-time thing though, isn't it? There's a chance we may get another 1.5 million, uh, I believe in June for the fiscal year for wow. a total of 3 million. So again, certainly appreciative with them and us yeah. uh, those funds. Um, so certainly a good positive financial report. Well, hopefully that trend will carry over as we close out this fiscal year in June and then start FY22 on July 1st. Stand for any questions. Chris, like that, that what the, uh, the month of April, that collection, you said that was the highest or second highest we've ever the had? The month of April was, as far as I can tell, the second highest monthly collection that the commission has ever had. Um, and we missed being the highest by about, I think it was $85,000. Uh, so that 1.47 million was a substantial collection for us on a monthly basis. Any insight as to why? Yeah, um, of that 1.4 million, about 1.1, 1.2 was um, from excise taxes from a local Oklahoma City Metro company that purchased two aircraft and paid excise taxes, two rather large aircraft, obviously. So um, we're, we're certainly appreciative of that company purchasing those planes and the revenue we got from that, so. Okay. It was a, a, Lear, a Lear 60 and a Challenger 600. Nice. Someone's flying some nice airplanes. <laughs> Good sign. All right. Yep. Well, sounds like a good story. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Next education update. Mr. Chairman, Paula has been, if, if my calendar was bad, Paula has been a traveling lady across the state. Uh, I think she has been out and about probably more than our airports team has um, and I just, I wanted to start off by saying thank you to, to everything that she has done over the last several months, because um, we have a lot of great outreach at the commission, but what Paula has been doing over these last couple of months, I don't think we've ever seen in terms of outreach on the aviation aerospace education front. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Paula, for that uh, before you started on your, uh, your, your, your agenda item and your speech. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. Sure. Thank you, Director, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. It's been my privilege um, in the last three months to start crisscrossing the state to visit with school superintendents, uh, boots on the ground, and really be able to talk to them. Number one, the first thing I always talk to them about is our uh, grants program at the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission. 
and the funds available to help them implement aviation education in their schools. And then secondly, I talked to them about the AOPA high school curriculum. As I reported, I believe at our last meeting, this current school year, 16 schools in Oklahoma have been implementing the AOPA curriculum. 15 of them, the pilot pathway, one school, uh, the UAS, the drone pathway. I'm happy to report that uh, as of today, we have doubled that number for next school year to, or a little over to 33 high schools that will be teaching AOPA high school curriculum for 21-22. Uh, very excited about that because COVID uh, precluded me, precluded us from going into schools uh, in, until after Christmas. And uh, so we really started late. Uh, you may not know that the window, the AOPA, AOPA offers uh, schools the opportunity to apply to teach the curriculum beginning in November and the window closes in May. So that for this year it's closing and I think we'll be right at about 33, 34 schools um, that have decided to move into teaching AOPA curriculum. Uh, I would be remiss. Oh, I would also like to mention in, in our FAA 625 grant, we set a goal to reach 50 high schools in the next 18 months. I think we'll easily be able to do that if, as long as COVID, uh, if we can continue to move forward and get into schools, I think we can easily meet that goal. And whether or not we receive the FAA grant, uh, it's my personal goal. To, I think that we can reach that and continue to, to move toward getting at least 50 schools to teach the curriculum. I would be remiss if I did not thank the superintendent of the Ada City Schools, Mike Anderson, and his aviation instructor, Chris Eckler, who have had an open door policy uh, to let schools visit the Ada High School Aviation Program and talk to them about uh, simulators and setting up a lab and in the last six weeks, uh, El Reno, um, Western Heights, prior, uh, week before last, uh, the teacher from Edmund Deer Creek flew to Ada and spent the day. And in each of those cases, uh, the superintendent has welcomed them and offered uh, words of wisdom as to the path Ada High School has gone down to try to implement a full-fledged uh, aviation program. So I would like to thank them. I would also like to thank a very, very young American Airlines envoy pilot from Paul's Valley, who during his furlough due to COVID, called me one day and said, Miss Keedy, uh, I want every school in Garvin County to know about the AOPA curriculum and I'll go with you. So we visited every school in Garvin County and he went with me and he uh, actually was able to say, hey, it changed my life. You know, this is a pathway that's available to students anywhere in Oklahoma, and I want to share my story. So I'm appreciative to him. Four of those schools in Garvin County have now signed up, uh, one of them with a total enrollment of, at, at their high school, nine through 12, of 74 students. And so for them to offer uh, a course is a very, very exciting. The second thing I'd like to speak to is that uh, Senator Thompson and Senator Rosino included me in an event in Okima, uh, which was an economic development event uh, with their chamber, with their schools. Uh, ACES committee uh, representatives were there as were uh, Dr. Marcy Mack from Oklahoma Career Tech. We had a wonderful day uh, talking about how small, com small communities can work together uh, to develop their town, develop their industry, develop their schools. It was a very, very positive experience. Um, also, I will mention that Director Ardees and I have been meeting with the Oklahoma State Department of Education about the possibility of perhaps offering the AOPA curriculum for core credit rather than elective credit. And let me talk to you about how important that would be. Because for instance, um, if a ninth grade student in most schools, a ninth grade student only has two elective opportunities. If that student is in band and athletics, then there's no way that that student can enter the aviation pathway uh, in the ninth grade and move through all four years. And so it's our wish, our hope that perhaps we can get some core credit and allow aviation AOPA curriculum to replace 
another course, subject area course, and allow them to get that credit for, toward graduation. So those are continued conversations. They are difficult conversations because to, to, in order to change something that's Oklahoma graduation requirements uh, includes the Oklahoma Board of Regents and other uh, entities that would have to okay that. And then finally, I'll just mention our grants for this year. The due date is May 31st for the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission grant cycle. Uh, obviously, the implementation this year of this year's recipients was very difficult due to COVID. Uh, many of them ran into some not being able to go to events or to use some of their grant funds in the way that they had hoped. But we we are we'll finalize those reports and have them ready for you. And then we'll also. Uh, close out the new applications on May 31st and begin looking at those. So I'd be delighted to, to answer any questions, stand for any questions. I'm, uh, I'm really excited you've been able to double the number of schools and uh, your goal of 50, I think is very admirable. Um, since it's a STEM program, I would think you would hopefully get somewhere into the core curriculum under science. Yes, we're working on that. Uh, one of the Right now, the graduation requirement is that uh, a student must either have two hours of world, world language, two hours or two hours of uh, computer science. We're talking in our conversations, perhaps two hours of STEM could uh, also be included in that. And that way those credits would, would count towards core uh, in the science area, as you said. So we're, we're trying to remove as many barriers as we can. As I said, they're difficult conversations. In those conversations, the assistant superintendent from uh, prior public schools, Mike Anderson from the Ada City Schools, we have some superintendents who are also voicing their concerns and wanting us to move forward in that, in that right. way as well. Right. So. Well, we're very thankful for all of your efforts. We're really glad to have you. Thank you so much. Next item is uh, Aviation Art Contest. Sandra? Thank you, Commissioners. Paula and I did not synchronize our, our um, comments, and so you just missed the slide that showed uh, Chairman uh, Thompson. So I'm going to talk to you about the Aviation Art Contest. And um, this year, it, it was a little smaller. We, we were down about 90% from our entries. And um, we are going to work to bring it back to that 13 to 1400 level of entries. We did not print an aviation art contest calendar last year due to COVID and the distribution issues that that would have caused at our schools with the students not being in the classroom. And so if, if you'll advance the next slide, I did just want to share with you some of the winning entries. We huh. had just under 100 entries this year and Representative Wendy Stearman from uh, Commissioner Potter's district uh, came and was one of our celebrity judges and Chase Rutledge, Rutledge also came to the office and Matt Rank with Delta um, uh, was also one of our judges. So this is the junior division and if you'll go to the next slide, this is the intermediate division and I'm sorry the slides kind of don't represent it well but and then the next slide is the senior division. And so we did not have an art contest ceremony this year at the state capitol um, due to COVID. The state capitol uh, is not allowing visits to the Senate chamber just quite yet. So hopefully next year we'll be back to do that. So I just wanted to bring this information to you. Thank you, Senator. And we'll Appreciate get it. to work on next year. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Grayson, Oshkosh, sounds exciting. Yes, sir. Uh, from everything I'm hearing and the planning that I know is going on in the background, Oshkosh is a go. So uh, we're excited about it. I know uh, our partners are excited about it. I know uh, Senator Inhofe's office is excited about it as well. Um, we have several partners, several of the same suspects that always go to Oshkosh, Ada, uh, Ardmore, Enid. Uh, we also have uh, Durant, who's a new partner this year. Our Oklahoma Department of Tourism uh, is partnering with us. And we're still soliciting a few other partners as well uh, to join us. So uh, before you today is a funding request to do the partnership for up to $4,000. Uh, typically, it comes in at about $3,000 or $3,300, depending on how many partners in our total final cost. So uh, staff recommends approval. 
And uh, I hope that uh, some of you all will be able to join us up there this year. Are you planning another luncheon in the tent over by the lake? Uh, luncheon by the tent over at the lake, same time, same location, if they allow us. Okay. So well, hopefully Senator Inhofe will show again. I, I, uh, I, I think he will. I think he's all excited right. about it. He, he missed out last year, as did we all. Yes, we did. Well, I, I can't speak highly enough for this, but uh, any, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, let's call a roll. Yes. 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 Commissioner Rich. Yes. Commissioner Rainey. Yes. Chairman Putnam. Yes. That's going to be a good time. Uh, item 12, partnership sponsorship, Oklahoma Department of Commerce for the Tinker and the Primes. Uh, continuing on, uh, Tinker and the Primes is a go for August. Uh, we partner on this booth with several other state entities, Department of Commerce, Career Tech, uh, and a handful of others. And so we are splitting the cost of the booth in fourths. Uh, total cost is about $4,000. We're requesting uh, up to $1,000 for the OAC share of the booth. Staff recommends approval. And as you all know, Tinker and the Primes is a big deal for the DOD and the contracting business. And as we heard yesterday in the caucus meeting, um, we're trying to get a little bit more of that business to stay stateside in Oklahoma, as opposed to going out across the country. So this will be an opportunity to let Oklahoma companies shine. Having been involved in this through the Air Force Association for a number of years, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal and it's a good opportunity for us. I think. Again, uh, do we hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. And call a roll, please. Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Okay. Thank you, 12. All right. Flight, FAA Flight Inspection Services Agreement. I'd like to hear about that one. This is uh, something we've done for about or maybe five years now, uh, Mr. Chairman and commissioners, uh, as a part of the things that airports have to do on a routine basis, if there's an AIP project uh, that requires either a change to a nav aid uh, or the installation of a new nav aid that has to be flight inspected, uh, we will help them flight inspect it. So instead of an airport having to go out and do an individual agreement with the FAA, which takes in the neighborhood of two to three, maybe four months, uh, we have a statewide agreement in place to, to do this. And so what we do is we just simply replenish that agreement as the money gets drawn down. Uh, a lot of times we're getting reimbursed from the sponsor. So if it's not a project that we're participating in, it's just an NPE only project. We will use our agreement to fund that flight inspection for a set of happies, for example. And then the sponsor as part of their AIP program will send us, we'll invoice them, they'll send us the cost of that back. Uh, and so time, the time has come to where we need to, uh, replenish the agreement, we're getting down to about $15,000. And so we, in order to schedule more flight inspections, we got to pay up again another $50,000 so that we can schedule more flight inspections in the summer as projects get finished. Okay, any questions? Discussion? All right, I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Okay, call a roll, please. Commissioner Potter. Yes. Commissioner Ortega. Yes. Commissioner Ritz. Yes. Commissioner Rainey. Yes. Chairman Putnam. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Okay. System plan update, Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the Oklahoma Airport System Plan update, this uh, project is now currently in full swing and it's being carried out by Javiation as the prime consultant on this project along with some sub-consultants, uh, Lochner and Mar Arnold. So for any of our airports that receive any calls from any, any of these consultants, please be receptive. And if you have any questions, you can always call me as well at the office. Um, but just know that all three of those consultants are working on this project. And I know that several folks have heard from Lochner in the recent past. So any questions, obviously call me for that. On April 30th, we actually had the first of a series of webinars that we're going to carry out between now and the end of the project, which we anticipate to run through about December, potentially into the February timeframe. 
And uh, these webinars are really meant to ensure that stakeholders remain updated throughout the entirety of their process because we want to make sure that their voices are heard throughout. So if there are things are, we're missing or, or perspectives that we're not taking in as we're going through this update, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to ask questions or add any, anything that we may be missing. So uh, obviously for anybody that's a part of these airports across the state and the system, please tune into the, the, the webinars as they come forward. The next webinar is planned for the middle of June and we'll be getting the date and time out for that very soon. So look forward to seeing everybody again for a webinar in about a month. Uh, in the last webinar we saw, if anybody wants to see um, that first webinar, we do have that on our YouTube page. We do have a playlist that will have just all of the uh, system plan update webinars as a part of that. Uh, in this webinar, we talked about the, um, how the last time that we really updated the system plan and had a full system plan update was actually 1999. And so this update will really help to ensure that we're acting upon valid data moving forward. Obviously, the recommendations that come out of this update will result in projects um, that help, they'll help guide us in future projects as we look to program those into our ACP moving forward as we'll speak about here and here shortly. So this, this will be serve as a foundation for some of that information to go, that we can go off of and put some metrics behind the, the projects that we bring before you for the airport construction program. Um, this project kicked off with two surveys, one being the airport inventory survey. So that went out to all of our system plan airports to get information regarding their services and facilities. And we also had a stakeholder survey that went out to all users, users of our airport system across the state. So for any airport that has yet to complete that initial sur uh, inventory survey, please contact me or Javiation. We'd be happy to walk, walk you through that. I know there's been several airports that are going through personnel changes, so that's a big part of why we don't have a, a handful of those, but we're still reaching out to those airports to make sure we get the best information we can. As we all know, the, this project is only going to be good, as good as the information that we put in, so we want to make sure that we, we make sure we get out the best possible outcome as part of this project. Uh, the first webinar also hit on really the main purpose of the system plan update. It's to help ensure that our state has a balanced and viable airport system. We want to make sure that the system is economically sustainable. And it also incorporates the new guidance from the FAA that's obviously changed since we last updated this in 1999. We want to make sure that we're updating that according to the new standards. Uh, it'll help provide a blueprint to ensure that the items and projects that we're investing in are for airports and uh, that are most essential to the success of the overall system. So it'll help to generate a searchable GIS database. So bringing us into the 21st century um, with that database to host the data that's gathered as a part of this project. So that all stakeholders can take a look at that information, be integrated with our um, airport pavement management system. So you can see both aspects of those systems online in a GIS system and really pinpoint what it is that we wanna look at. So you can see the services, facilities and the PCI pavement condition index really all in one place. So. It'll be a great system once it's up and running. Uh, so the intent really is to get the GIS database up to date now, and then we can actually update that going forward as we do our 5010 inspections or other pavement inspections to make sure that that information stays up to date rather than just being done at one point in time and then having to update it you know, 20 years later. So uh, we're really excited with what that's going to bring. So we'll be able to update that as we go along. Aviation is also currently looking at the roles and classifications as part of this project. It's kind of the phase that we're in right now. And so we're looking at uh, the adequacies, deficiencies within the system and where that lands uh, for each and what role that puts each airport within the system. We're currently at three roles. We might look at, you know, expanding to potentially four, maybe even five, but we're trying to see what that sweet spot is and what those metrics will be so that we can really get uh, a good breakdown of the roles of the airports within our system across the state. Um, so this will also include identifying any potential redundancies in the system. Obviously, we don't want to put projects before you for approval that, uh, you know, two different projects that are essentially serving the same community. So we want to make sure that we are finding the efficiencies in the system. If there are any redundancies that we're identifying those and getting a suggestion or a recommendation from Javiation as a part of this project. Airport roles will be determined by analyzing various demand facilities, services, and also demographic characteristics. So that's what will help break us out. Uh, into those airport roles. We're really taking a ground up approach and, uh, and reanalyzing every airport rather than just assuming they're gonna say, kind of stay in the same spot they are. We wanna make sure that we're kind of taking a Blake Slate approach to make sure we get the, this airport system plan really lined out and taking us into the future and helping us make good decisions going forward. And uh, the system evaluation will also inc re include a report card for each airport. And this report card will have um, a grade in the areas of safety 
efficiency, accessibility, economic support, and user services. So it'll give us a guide, kind of a, a benchmark to say, hey, these are the things that we could do better or you know, help see, okay, these guys are doing great over here. What can we do to mirror that? So it's really to make a, a, a system that works together so you can kind of have those metrics and work to better yourself um, and, and going forward so that we can get the system that we get to the best place that we possibly can. And so this, uh, the last thing this analysis will do really um, that I'll discuss here today is to help determine if there are site locations that may benefit from combining resources or potential other site locations that may be beneficial. We'll talk a little bit about one of those here in just a moment, but it's really just to make sure that um, we're planning for the future as best we can, which like that's kind of the, in a nutshell, that is what the system plan is all about. So uh, other than the items that Javiation is carrying out that I just discussed, Lochner is also in the process of making airport site visits to 49 different locations across the state um, to really check on the runway protection zones and any com commercial development uh, opportunities at some of those airports. And so he did, uh, Keenan English with Lochner, did a second airport inventory survey specifically for runway protection zones because we want to make sure that we know the runway protection zones that our airports do own versus what they do not. So that if there are any property issues that arise that we know um, which, which items are airport controlled versus not and how to best take the next step forward if we need to resolve any of those issues. The best part to get, the best way to get in front of it is to get a, a clear picture. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that this was incorporated into our plan because it's often not something that's sought out in a lot of the other system plans we saw across the country. And so we think it's gonna be a very helpful tool for us going forward. And that is the end of my system plan update and I'd be happy to stand for <laughs> Sounds very detailed. Any questions or concerns? Discussion? All right, thank you. Let's move on to the nuts and bolts here on 15. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Up for your approval is the fiscal year 2022 to 2026 airport construction program. We did have a couple of submissions during the public comment period. We just had three. One was voicing the support of the control tower uh, project down in Norman. The other two were to simply correct some information uh, on individual airport pages, specifically regarding based aircraft. It just hadn't updated to the, the spreadsheet that we provided in the ACP. Um, it was just kind of, they hit the right window where we didn't update at the same time. So that was all we had in terms of the comments. And we did have a few projects that have changed since the March meeting. So those that have changed in some way or have been added are the one, the slides that we'll go through here just shortly. But the first project that I wanna mention is the only project that was actually taken out of this uh, ACP. And this was at William R. Pogue Municipal Airport, a project to rehabilitate the runway out there in Sand Springs. We removed that from the ACP in order to make way for some other potential projects out there. And so we'll continue to work with that airport to determine how best we can assist them moving forward. We just wanna make sure that uh, they have the time to take and set their priorities and, and help them figure out the projects that they wanna line up going forward. Uh, and then we'll work on partnering with those as best we can. So for the first project that will change here will be at Ardmore Municipal Airport. This is the project to rehabilitate runway 1331. This project was simply changed and updated to include installing new LED runway lights as part of a state grant. And so the, uh, the total project cost now for this be uh, one, a little over $1.7 million. FAA is still providing 928,000 of that commission at 450,000. So that'll be uh, to take care of the lion's share of the, uh, the LED runway lights and the local share at just under $24,000 for this project. So again, that's just updating that to include runway lights so we can match some, get some of the efficiencies out of doing that at the same time, not having to close the runway down later on down the road to, to take care of those lights. The next project is at Atopa Municipal Airport. This is an added project to this ACP. And this is to complete an environmental and pre preliminary design for a new airport location. Uh, what we're bringing before you wanting put in the ACP is actually for phase two of this study. And the first phase will actually occur the, the year prior in uh, calendar year 2022. And that'll be funded with uh, non-primary entitlements only. So we'll be helping out with the, the, the next phase of the study for that. For several years, we've really known of the need for an alternative location in Atoka. It's been apparent due for several, for several years due to property constraints and really not being able to expand to serve the flying public down there in the Atoka region. We have preliminary information from the system plan effort that supports this study. And we also have received the official request from the city of Atoka. So we believe now is truly the best time to move forward with this study based on the information that we have in hand. And then the city also provided some uh, information regarding uh, demand that they are currently under, unable to serve. So that's what's put us 
I want to, got us to where we want to put this in the airport construction program now for a total project cost for the survey of $450,000. The commission and the FAA splitting that at uh, $213,750 a piece and the local share at $22,500 for this project. Do you know how long that runway is now? That's uh, 3,000. I believe it's uh, three or 32, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Right. Uh, and as you can see from that picture, they have a highway on one end and then a uh, significant ravine that goes up to a hill on the other. Um, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible to expand where it's currently at unless we bury the highway, which we know that's not that cheap to do either. <laughs> Thank you. So the next project is at Kingfisher Municipal Airport. Oh, pardon me, skipped ahead a little bit there on us. This is at Broken Bow Municipal Airport. This is another project that we added to calendar year 2024 to rehabilitate the runway at Broken Bow Municipal. So a state grant at 95.5% uh, split, total project cost of $600,000, 570,000 from the commission and the local share at 30,000. The next project to be added to this ACP is a rehabilitation of the, a portion of the terminal apron and install perimeter fencing at David J. Perry Airport there in Goldsby. They have a portion of the, uh, the airport they really need to get um, rehabilitated out there and then also at the same time wanting to rearrange the fence and the gate out there at David J. Perry Airport to encourage and allow and facilitate for better access to that terminal building that was constructed a few years ago down there. And uh, so that way we can keep the movement area uh, secured, but also increasing the accessibility to that, uh, the facilities out there so that people can take advantage of those because they, it's a wonderful airport down there just south of Norman. Total project cost of this is uh, $628,450, a little over 400,000 coming from the FAA. Commission share at just under 160,000 and then just shy of 55,000 would be the local share for this project. Okay. At El Reno Regional Airport, this, uh, the project to construct the terminal building is simply citing back one year to state fiscal year 2022. Um, total project costs remain the same at a million dollars split between the commission and the local uh, local share there of 500,000 a piece. And I believe this is primarily due to the cost of uh, materials right now. I believe the bids came back a little higher than we would have hoped. And so pushing it back just a little bit, allowing for time for those factories to come back up and running and help bring down the cost of materials will help get us some more favorable bids going forward. I think the same case uh, occurs at the next project to at Jones Memorial Airport in Bristow. This, uh, the terminal project and, and self-service fuel project out there again, sliding back just one year. Uh, it's total project cost will remain the same for this project at just under $1.4 million. There is an EDA grant covering a large portion of this project at over, a little over 822,000, just under 260,000 from the commission and the local share, at just shy of 300,000 for this project. Again, that one, most of, uh, several of these right here just sliding back one year. Help me understand that acronym EDA. Uh, it's the Economic Development Authority Administration. Economic Development Administration. It's a federal uh, federal entity. Okay. Um, so they tap their pockets. That's cool. It, it's another. <laughs> it's been another source of funding, Mr. Chairman, that we have tapped into twice, and hopefully many times into the future too. All right. Great. <coughs> At Kingfisher Municipal Airport, again, this one just sliding back one year. This is a project to reconstruct the taxi lanes in the apron area at a 95-5 split from the commission. Total project cost of $400,000, uh, 380 from the commission and the local share of $20,000 for that project. Another project added, this one in Okmulgee Regional Airport. This is in, to install new runway LED runway lighting out at their airport. Another state grant at 95-5 split, total project cost $450,000, uh, commission providing $427,500 of that, and $22,500 at the local share. And this is a project being added for calendar year 2025. At Paul's Valley Municipal Airport, this project is actually moving forward one year to state fiscal year 2022. And this is a project to construct a taxi lane that will uh, provide support for the new hangar development going on down there. Uh, total project costs and everything remaining the same at $500,000. Commission providing 475,000 of that, the local share of $25,000. What are we looking at here? The green? Is that the construction? So green? it's uh, all of the visual there gives you a little bit of an idea of all the things that they'd like to do. 
And on the, uh, the bottom middle portion of that, you can see a hanger and a small apron area that is circled. And so this is the preliminary idea. It's circled in a red line. It's very, it's kind of tough to see on that. So mm -hmm. I do apologize. And so we are, we are kind of discussing the different uh, options out there and the layouts that can occur for out there, but they really want to, um, they're, they're putting forth a hangar complex or a, a hangar facility so that they can bring in some new tenants and they just want to, uh, we're helping uh, get them some access to that area. So I, it very well may look a little bit different than the, uh, the preliminary graphic that we have before you today. We're still working with the airport and their engineers to determine exactly what that's going to look like. Okay. At Stroud Municipal Airport, uh, the project will remain where it is to extend the runway 1836. However, we have added the installation of new LED runway lights along with that project. Again, mainly to, uh, to enjoy the efficiencies that come along with doing all those at the same time and not having to uh, close the runway later on. Total project cost of just under $1.4 million, 972 coming from the FAA, uh, 350,000 from the commission and a local share of just under $77,000. And the last project with any changes before you is going to be the West Woodward Airport. This project is moving forward one year to state fiscal year 2024. And so we expect that to occur in calendar year 2023. Again, I just hit on that because I do understand that sometimes mixing in the fiscal and the calendar year is a little confusing, but uh, we like to put all of them before you so you can see when uh, that expects to hit the coffers, but also when we expect the, the work to actually be completed. So this is a, a project to construct new connect connector taxiways. All of the funding will remain the same. Again, just sliding forward one year for a total project cost of just under 957000 700000 from the FAA, the commission providing 200000 for that project, and a local share of just under so Those are all the projects that have changed since the last time we discussed this through March. Uh, staff recommends approval of the 2022 to 2026 airport construction program. And obviously I stand for any questions. Are there any questions? Okay, any discussion? And then we'll, uh, we'll solicit uh, a motion for approval. So for, so I move to approve. Second. Okay, do we have a motion and second? Uh, let's call the roll please. Yes. Commissioner Ortega. Yes. Commissioner Ritz. Yes. Commissioner Rainey. Yes. Chairman Putnam. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Okay, Mr. Nagavi. Did I say that right? Okay. Nagavi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know the words. Uh, okay. About your grant program. That's true. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Uh, we have a project for construction at McCartan County Regional Airport, Idabel. Uh, the project consists of installing omnidirectional approaching lighting system models at runway uh, in 20. Next slide, please. Uh, based on the bids, the total project cost is a shy of uh, 514,000 and will be funded with over 488,000 of a state grant fund and about 26,000 of sponsor matching fund. Staff recommends approval and I'm standing for any question you have. Contingent upon the commission receiving an acceptable grant application. That would be from, from Ida Bell, from the sponsor. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see, did I see a year in here that we're looking at? We don't have a date yet. so that uh, they can start construction this summer. Okay, great. Well, that was my question. Any other questions? We have a motion for approval. So moved. Okay, got one for Mr. Ortega. Uh, second? Second. Uh, call a vote, please. Commissioner Potter. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Yes. Commissioner Ritz. Yes. Commissioner Rainey. Yes. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> okay, various location grants, number 17. Yeah. Uh, this year we have four projects for PR preliminary engineering report. Uh, the first three airports, Fairview, Municipal, uh, Godfrey, and Miami. Uh, we're going to have a uh, taxiway relocation or reconstruction. 
and for pulse value we are going to have a, a runway reconstruction. Uh, the total estimated cost for these four projects is shy of 331,000, and all of them uh, will be funded with a uh, federal grant. Uh, staff recommend approval and thank you. Any questions you have? So, this is all federal money in this case. Taking advantage of the 100% federal money this year, um, FY21 projects are 100% just like last year's project for 100%. And so since this is a grant from FAA to OAC, um, it's 100%. Thank you, Congress, for allowing us to benefit from that. Wow. Any other questions or discussion? We have a motion for approval. So moved. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, call the vote, please. Hagan. Yes. Commissioner Ritz. Yes. Commissioner Rainey. Yes. Chairman Putnam. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Thank you very much. Sandra? Thank you, commissioners. Uh, we have really enjoyed being here with you today in our hybrid meeting, and uh, we look forward to things opening back up. And so you'll see um, on your events summary that things are opening back up. Uh, there are fly-ins happening all this fall uh, at Westheimer and El Reno and also at Guthrie Edmond. And I have pointed out to you just today, Skyatook is this Friday. If you would like for us to facilitate you being there, please call me, call Director Artis or Andrea, and we'd be happy to help you. On Saturday, uh, Commissioner Rainey, Commissioner Putnam, and Commissioner Ortega, and myself and Director Artis will be at the MACA fly-in. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Is it MACA? It's just an acronym. Okay, I wasn't sure if the, what the acronym was, but uh, Altus Air Force Base is hosting a fly-in, and so we are going to Altus to host some state representatives and state senators to Altus Air Force Base, and Commissioner Ortega is going to help us with that. Super. And so I have four representatives and three senators coming and so uh, we're excited about that and uh, having them to Commissioner Ortega's district. So um, the um, TASM, Tulsa Air and Space Museum, is having an aviator ball on May 22nd. It's an in-person event. There are still tickets. They're a little pricey, but it does benefit the museum. And I would really encourage you. I know I just talked to Tanya this morning and Director Artis and myself and Paula Keedy will be there to support the museum and their efforts and their education efforts. I would really encourage you, if you have the means and the availability in your time, to please come with us. It would be a great time for all of us. So uh, Tinker and the Primes, you'll see there. And also Sundance is having uh, a fly, uh, uh, their breakfast. And are, are we back in person now, yep, Commissioner Platinum? Okay, so, so I listed that as well. And the Oklahoma Pilots Association has a very special guest speaker in June, it's Director Artis. And so if you would like to come to that, I know that he would love to have you all listen to him speak. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to yield for questions. And, and if you guys ever need anything, if you are having an event at your airport that I may have missed, please let me know about that. And I'd be happy to list it and share it in our social media and on our website. So I would stand for questions from anybody. Questions? Thank you very much, Sandra, appreciate it. Concluding remarks, Director Artis. I, uh, I think the only thing that I would add to the program or not add to the program, but reemphasize is as we hit the road this summer and we go out and visit airports in your districts. Um, we are going to include you on those invites. Do not feel obligated to attend all of them because we're going to be doing a lot of traveling, uh, but we want you to feel included. And if you do have, or your time permits or your schedule permits, uh, please, please join us. Um, some of our meetings may be a simple hour. Some of them may be a half a day. Um, and so it will just kind of depend on your schedules and what you do or do not want to attend. But I promise you will be coming to airports in your district either for big events or simply just small meetings. Um, but we'll be there and 
would love to have your involvement if you, you want to partake. Okay, thank you very much. And that's for the next meeting. I don't believe it has changed. I have on my schedule, it's down on July 14th, Wednesday, 10 o'clock in this room. Is that correct? Okay. All right, then uh, if, if there are no other items on the agenda, this meeting is hereby adjourned.